very, very grateful to be here and to share this Lenten time uh, with you. Let's pray together. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, another season has started, another season of Lent. Um, another opportunity for deepening our lives has been given to us. And so my prayer is that we would be able to receive the gift that God has offered us during this special season. So what is that gift? What gift does God have for us? It's the gift of life, the fullness of life, a life of depth, a life of deep devotion to God through Christ. God wants us to live with the deepest, fullest life possible. And that's really what the season of Lent is all about. That's the gift of Lent. This is a morning prayer, and perhaps you have said this prayer in your own lives. It goes like this. So far today, God, I've done all right. I haven't gossiped, lost my temper, been greedy, grumpy, nasty, selfish, or overindulgent, and I'm very thankful for that. But in a few minutes, God, I'm going to get out of bed. And from then on, I'm probably going to need a lot more help. Have you said that prayer? It's a very familiar one for me. I really like this theme of these Lenten meditations. You know, we get caught up in what society and our culture tells us is valid, is legitimate, is affirming to us in terms of social media, pursuing all of these likes to be seen, to be affirmed in the eyes of others. And I thought that our Matthew 4 passage is really appropriate for this theme. This story of Jesus' temptations is part of our lectionary reading for this year's Lenten season. Earlier in Matthew chapter 3, verse 16, we read this. And when Jesus was baptized, when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And the voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved with whom I am well pleased. And with this profound knowledge of God's loving affirmation, it enabled Jesus to embrace his belovedness in God. And with that assurance of his belovedness, he entered the wilderness of his temptations. And this was the enemy's prime opportunity to try to exploit Jesus' physical, mental, and spiritual weaknesses and to compel his selfish desires. Now, at first glance, the temptation story of Jesus seems far removed, disconnected from our world, our reality, our lives. What does this have to do with my life personally? Those aren't the kind of temptations that I face in my life. What is the connection? I believe it's in the subtlety of these temptations where we can find ourselves and we can see how Jesus understood them to mean for our sake. We read that Satan keeps reminding Jesus 
that he's the son of God. Satan is not questioning this. The grammar of this passage clearly indicates that Satan clearly understands that Jesus is the son of God. In actuality, what he's saying is, since you are the son of God, since you're the son of God, do these things. So we have three temptations that Jesus faced. Three temptations that Satan is tempting him to use his divine power for, however way he pleases. But each one speaks to our lives as well. Each of these temptations speaks to our lives and the commitment we make and the price we are willing to pay to compromise. So first, to turn the stones into bread. Jesus hasn't eaten for 40 days. It's a long time. Satan says, you're the son of God. You have the power to turn these stones into bread. You can eat. You're so hungry. So why don't you just work your power and eat? You deserve this. You're entitled to this, aren't you? Use your power to gratify yourself. Do whatever makes you feel good, whatever satisfies your deepest hungers and yearnings. Why deprive yourself? Save yourself. Gratify yourself. You're the son of God. Isn't that good enough? Doesn't that make you who and what you are? This temptation was in both the act itself of self-focused power and in the attitude, the motive, and the design of performing the act. Satan was tempting Jesus to see himself purely in self-serving terms. You are your own ends, your purpose, your fulfillment. And so he could fulfill whatever human need whenever he felt like it because he deserves it. It's saying that if Jesus eats, I mean, it's a simple act. But in this story, if Jesus eats, then we, we are given the green light to give in to any and all our human desires and cravings at our whim. Because that's what's most important. That's what we prioritize. That's what we value, not our spirituality. Only our human cravings deserve gratification. Secondly, throw yourself, Jesus, throw yourself off the temple and let the angels rescue you. When people see this, you'll be famous. You'll be worshipped as a superstar. You'll have them in the palm of your hand. Your mission will be so easy. I'm helping you, Jesus. I'm helping you accomplish your mission. I'm making your job easier. Let them see your extraordinary power. It's your status that is ultimately important. How others see you, the image you hold up to their eyes. Let others determine your identity and worth. Don't you want them to like you? 
Don't you want them to follow you? Then be spectacular. Grab their attention. If Jesus jumps off the temple and shows the people a great, spectacular magic act, then surely they will follow. He would be the absolute ruler and master of the whole world. He could bring peace. He can bring justice. He can bring love to the people, and they will fall in line. If Jesus does this, then we are given the green light to have our ego seduced by the adoration of others. This is a real temptation for us. And perhaps much of our culture and society has given in to this. Thirdly, surrender yourself to Satan and you will have unlimited power. In other words, satisfy your lust for control, power, status, settle, compromise, pay the price to sell your soul for a low ball sticker tag. Just bow to me. Satan is trying to get Jesus to take the bait of his entitlement. He could do anything he wants as the son of God. But we need to realize that if he were to do this, this would give Jesus a different identity altogether. A different identity than the one declared to him at his baptism. God's beloved, not God's superstar, not God's king, God's beloved. Have you ever wondered why, just as he begins his public earthly ministry, it's this message of belovedness that God wanted Jesus to embrace. Not that you're gifted with special powers. Not that you have to be prepared for all this attention and fame. But you are my beloved son. Embrace that. Let that sink into the depth of your soul. And once you have embraced that, you are ready. You're ready to start your ministry. If Jesus fell into these temptations, then instead of a ministry by love, Jesus would have been egged onto a ministry of power to be irresponsible, to be bloated with his pride and ego, to be tempted to use and abuse his power. Do whatever you want with your power, however way it suits you, whatever makes you happy and gratified. Take the easy path. And if Jesus bows down to the tempter in exchange for ultimate worldly power, then we are given the green light to give in to the bargain, the bargain of compromise in exchange for getting what we want, making us willing to pay any price for that ultimate objective, objective and pleasure. Each one of these temptations was designed to dramatically alter the very essence of Jesus' ministry, to change the course and character of his calling by God. If Jesus had failed and taken the bait, 
it would have compromised, indeed drastically altered the character, the heart, the values, the priorities, and very spirit of who he is, his ministry, and what he was purposed and called to do. The themes in the temptation story are not just for Jesus. They are for all humanity. By resisting the temptations, Jesus was protecting us by demonstrating, by proving to Satan what he and God's people are really about, fully accepting God's ways, the way of love, the way of mercy and justice. It was about Jesus modeling authentic spiritual life for us, leading us to God, to the way of God. Martin Luther King has this great quote. He understood well the pitfalls of power, the moral seduction of power, and the abuse of power. His work was to continue this aspect of Jesus' ministry, to bring hope to all, to all people, to bring God's message of love to all equally, to inspire people with the gift that God brings and to empower all in the eyes of God. This is one of his most famous quotes on justice. It's concerning the right marriage of love and power. One of the greatest problems in history is that the concepts of love and power are usually contrasted as polar opposites. Love is identified with the resignation of power and power with the denial of love. What is needed is a realization that power without love is reckless and abusive and that love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice. Justice at its best is love correcting everything that stands against love. We know that Jesus triumphed over each temptation and expelled the tempter. Those destructive lies about power, fame, entitlement were not going to have any part of Jesus' ministry. Jesus stayed true to his authentic self, his God-given identity that calls him the beloved. He remembered those important words, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. As we journey through Lent, let us remember our belovedness and carry that throughout our daily living and in our relationships. Let us stay near to the heart of God as our belovedness echoes throughout our lives and in our service and ministries of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. God of all times and seasons, God of grace and reconciliation, God of liberation and new life, in this holy season of Lent, 
give us grace to lead a life of discipline as we journey to the cross. Christ knew in body, mind, and soul all the temptations and struggles of human life and was obedient to you in all things. Help us to discern by your spirit what we must reject and what we must embrace, what we must lay down and what we must take up, what we must end and what we must begin. And so as we journey, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion, the ever-presence of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and always. Amen.